My name's Nina Biddle, and thank you for the introduction. It describes exactly who I am and what I've done in the past. I was asked by David Coates to come along um, to have a chat about networks and how networks work within industry, particularly um, with a, a, a view to looking at knowledge networks, particularly industrial ones, such as the um, KTN, but also to, to, to see how these have actually how they're relevant for very small SMEs such as ourselves, and to demonstrate how these different networks actually apply and how the relationships that are built up within these have um, improved, assisted, and aided our business. How they connect to one another, obviously, and also how it's cap you're capable of using it to collaborate on various projects and share knowledge. So the outline of the talk is who, who is Gwent on Electronic Materials? None of you will have heard of it. Um, what do we do? How do we do it? Uh, what kind of business sectors did we start out in? Uh, and what kind of business sectors are we in now? And also to describe how we've managed to get there. So as a small Welsh SME, Gwent Electronic Materials was founded in 1988. We're actually based in Pontypool. Uh, not a million miles away from here. The company is wholly owned by principal directors. Two directors started it. We have had no venture capital funding. We are totally self-supporting, always have been. Um, and the company was set up basically to manufacture passive component materials. Um, the idea being that we would actually specialise in the production of custom-made materials for um, big manufacturers um, of components. And the reason for that was primarily that the vast majority of other paper manufacturers have standard products on the shelf that don't necessarily always suit a manufacturing process. Um, and the vast majority of large paste manufacturers don't want to sell niche products. We actually sell niche products that are tailor-made to a customer's specific requirements. Um, and we found that it's a very useful business to be in. Currently, we're only 25 staff. Most of those are technical. Um, most of them are professionally qualified, and we have a highly productive, um, very efficient manufacturing unit which is capable of producing everything that we need. So in the 1990s, the vast majority of the paste that we actually supplied, these are screen printing paste, were, were for the electroceramics market. These are things like uh, positive, temperature, positive temperature coefficient emitters. NTCs, varistas, MLCCs, they're all basically electronic components. And it was all products that were used um, onto ceramics that were all high temperature. And the principles of the op operating principles at the time really were basically to work directly with customers. We would go out and visit customers, find out what they wanted. It's surprising in industry how many people take product that is off the shelf that doesn't really suit them. Um, they have various issues, whether it's to do with um, the actual printing properties of the material, whether it's to do with the compatibility with their production line, etc., etc. But they tailor their production line and put up with the nuisance that a lot of these products cause. Um, where we actually specialise is that we, we came to them to say, what do you want? How do you want it modified? What, are you, what do you want from the product? And that's how we've actually formulated new products for these people. The other thing that we do, which a lot of large companies don't do, is we actually offer all our customers full technical support. If any of our products go down for any reason or they have problems, they know that they can contact us very quickly and we will do our best to resolve any of the issues. And that's been an operating principle that we've had right from day one. So why did we diversify? Why didn't we just stick with the electroceramics business? Well, to be honest, the electroceramics business, which was huge in the early 90s within Europe, um, progressively, a lot of the companies um, were bought out by global companies who then basically looked at the, how much these component, components were costing. And the single biggest factor in component manufacture quite often is labour. Um, and of course, with cheap labour out in the Far East, a lot of these businesses were shifted out Far East, which meant that there was a huge slump in the market. And there was also a lot of jobs lost within, within countries like Germany, Austria, who were the major component manufacturers at the time. Um, there was also a significant growth 
in the biomedical diagnostic products area. The UK still is one of the biggest manufacturers of glucose strips. Um, and that's by no accident. That's by a lot of support from the Scottish agencies to set up manufacture, large manufacturing units up in Scotland to actually manufacture these materials. So there was a growing market both here in the UK and also throughout Europe for the new technology that was involved in developing glucose sensors, um, which was one of the areas that we saw as a, an area that we should be moving into, well away from anything that we were used to or experienced in. Most large manufacturers also at the time rationalised their product lines. They were only really interested in producing tonnage quantities of precious metal paste. Again, they would have a standard product line. They didn't really want to have 50 versions of the same thing that all were slightly different. So they rationalized and took them down to five or six products that they could sell large quantities of. And God bless them, we picked up a lot of business. Um, they were particularly good at um, getting rid of small, very expensive precious metal materials that were based on gold and platinum um, for the gas sensor markets. In, in particular. Um, and again, we had companies who actually came to us um, desperate. They had a process, they were selling sensors, their prime supplier had told them material was going to be obsolete within 12 months. What could they do? Could we do anything for them? And basically, we offered them full technical support, developed products for them that would actually match the products that they were taking, or in a lot of cases, actually be better than what they were having. So we, need, we actually recognised that there was a need to move into a new market sector. We were going to lose business. If we, were, if we were going to stay alive, we had to diversify. The first market sector, really, that we tackled was the medical diagnostics market. There's a huge jump from developing high-fire materials, which are all basically furnished at... Um, temperatures of 800 degrees C to suddenly move into products that are screen printable and capable of curing onto polymeric substrates uh, and also then making them functional and work in terms of um, having a response to glucose or being of use within the transducers that are used within glucose sensors. One of the main things that we had to do was actually pick up a knowledge of exactly what the chemistry was how we could produce products, how we could select raw materials, where we could get them from, how we could compound them together to produce products that would actually be of use um, to these new emerging companies. One of the best ways we found of doing that was actually to fund direct research at one of the universities. There is a very big biosensor group um, who are very very well known within the industry that were based not very far away from us at the University of the West of England. Um, we've fun funded several PhD students there and we've also supplied them with a huge amount of support in terms of re developing alternative sensors for a variety of applications. One of the interesting things of course is that as soon as you start funding students at universities or alternatively you supply your materials free of charge into universities you automatically get mentioned in papers and you automatically get mentioned in conferences. People started to take an interest. Um, and as a direct result of that, we then had the opportunity to network with um, some of the very large um, glucose manufacturers who then came to us. Because again, they had problems with products that they'd received. It wasn't quite right. They needed tweaking uh, and the bigger manufacturers were not prepared to do that, it wasn't cost effective for them. Uh, and in more recent years, as a direct result of that, um, we've actually funded stands at conferences, and in particular the um, Biosensors Conference, which is held every, I think it's every two years, every four years it might be. Um, we have a principal stand there now with other partners um, as a direct result of that, which gives us high visibility. The other thing we also realised was it wasn't just good enough to be able to make the basic paste that produces the transducer. The way a biosensor works is that you actually use biomolecules, enzymes or antibodies on the surface of these sensors to make them function. So we decided in 2000 to actually acquire a company that specialises in stabilising these biomolecules. Um, 
and we purchased them in 2000 purely and simply so that we would have the ability to go in and problem solve. Um, a lot of these companies were not having issues with the base transducers, but were actually having more issues with the enzymes and the mediators that were being used and the electrochemistry not working. Uh, and we thought it was a strategic um, decision to purchase applied enzyme technology because they would work with us um, in order to produce a completely complete solution to a lot of these companies. And as a direct result of that, we also have moved into the agri-foods industry as well to develop sensors for a whole variety of different applications. Um, by acquiring applied enzyme technology, we also then decided that we would set up several other companies at the same time. The big biosensor manufacturers, glucose manufacturers, generally had their own companies who manufactured instruments. When it came to agri-foods, measuring glucose in potatoes, for example, which is a huge market sector, um, measuring um, other materials such as um, the sweetness of onions. Um, there were fairly small quantities of meters that were required for a lot of these things. And they, there was nobody out there who was, who was looking at the electronics or the potential stats that were required to do the measurements on the sensors that we could manufacture. So we actually set up several of the companies with a view to diversifying into both instrument manufacture. So basically, the Gwent group of, it, of companies explained, uh, Gwent Electronic Materials manufacture the paste that go down to build the, to make the sensors. AET provide the protein stabilization, which makes your sensor function for whatever application. Uh, Gwent Biotechnology uh, manufacture measuring instruments, particularly for the agri-foods industry, which is much, much smaller market than glucose is. Um, GSL manufacture biosensors for the agri-foods. Um, LRH just happens to be a holding company. And the NDA that we have set up actually covers all of these companies. It's surprising how many people actually do come to us with one problem and wind up um, having several different solutions from several different areas. Um, 